maybe we should get started. It's 136. We have I'm letting yeah. one more person in from the waiting room. I was just going to say, Sarah Linda, in mm -hmm. case anybody was wondering, that one reason that we have skewed a little bit in favor of the slideshows is that when you're walking around and kind of pointing your iPhone at the pictures on the walls, sometimes you can't really see them as well as if you just put them on a slide because it's a better picture. And if it's something behind glass in the galleries, you might have some reflections. It might be kind of hard to see it. So that's one reason we don't always go and walk around the galleries, even though we call these virtual tours. They are. And plus, you know, we can't really do it when we're open because there's such a limited number of people who can be, you know, uh, in close proximity at any, any given time that this is much safer um, in these times. But anyway, Merle, we're gonna, we're gonna mute you along with everybody else now, if you don't mind, it was lovely speaking with you um, because Laura and Victoria are gonna get started, okay? We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very um, much. Okay, so, um, so I guess we'll, we'll get started. Um, I just wanna welcome everybody. Um, to this virtual tour of Women to the Four, part two, or part de, as we like to say. And, and I just have to have to mention that, you know, it's it's particularly um, significant today, this week, as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment with a record voter turnout this week. Um, more people and obviously more women than ever exercise their, exercise their franchise. So congratulations to the American people. Um, specifically about what we're gonna be doing today, um, following up on last month's look into the figural works in the exhibition um, that reflected women's various varied conceptions of the self. Today's themes and uh, uh, and reflections will focus on the representations of still life, nature, and life cycles. Laura Vukels, chair of the uh, museum's curatorial department, and Victoria McKenna Ratchin, curatorial assistant, are looking how, at how artists in the exhibition represent and relate to the world around them. Uh, they'll be delving into the deeper meanings and implications of still lifes and the built environment as well as unusual uses of everyday materials. Um, we are, I really wanna thank Laura and Victoria for doing a series of tours um, about this exhibition. We could not do the 40 plus artists in the show justice in just one, um, in just one take. So um, I want to uh, welcome everybody and mention again that you are muted. You, we can see you. Um, on the video unless you choose to turn that off. And we welcome all your comments and questions in the chat and they will be addressed at the end of the presentation. So um, without further ado, um, I want to also thank Olivia Cipriano who's facilitating and thank Laura and Victoria. Take it away. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, probably the next slide just pretty much says everything you just said which is thanking everybody in the, that's here and what everybody's doing and that everybody's muted. So maybe we could go to the third slide, Olivia. Olivia. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, as Sarah Linda mentioned, we divided this overall tour of the exhibition into two different tours. And one reason is because we do have 40, female identifying artists in the show spanning 150 years. So there's no way we could really talk about everybody uh, in one tour. And, you know, sometimes maybe if people are at the museum live, we might, you know, give a, a selection and maybe not talk about every single artist, but there's so many great artists in this show and so many living artists that we've been dealing with directly. We didn't want to leave anybody out. So we talked about figural art last time, which is a lot of art in the show. And then this is sort of, it's not just rest, it does make sense to us that we're grouping this 
as, as uh, still life and then sort of the broader world around us. So, um, and as Sarah Linda mentioned, in case people weren't at the other tour and in case you haven't been to the museum, this slide just shows some installation views that were taken by Stephen Panacasio of the overall uh, exhibition. Uh, some of these works will be talked about today. Some of them were talked about last time. I wanted to point out the beautiful script writing, Women to the Fore, which was done by our freelance designer, Natasha Maleshina. And then in the corner, in the extreme left corner of the top image, you see the mural, uh, the Garden of the Divine Feminine that was done by local artists, um, Patty Santos, Nancy Mendez, and Katori Walker. And I won't, we're not gonna be talking about it today, but I will point out something I pointed out last time that even though it's a figural work, it's all imbued with nature and actual like silk flowers and jewelry and other kinds of objects that you might find in still life. Uh, it really uh, contains both of those types of art. And um, so I wanted to, um, why don't we um, see the next slide please, Olivia. Apologies, there seems to be a little bit of a delay in changing the slides. We're, 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 we're victim of our Wi-Fi connections here. Uh, so I found this definition uh, of still life. I thought, well, maybe I should, you know, most people know what still life is, but maybe I should define it. And I actually found this definition on the Tate London's website, which I thought was rather hilarious that says it's one of the principal genres of Western art, essentially the subject matter of a still life painting or sculpture is anything that does not move or is dead. It literally says that on a museum's website. Um, and then, you know, it's not, and then they went on to have a much fuller definition than that. But one of the reasons that we started the exhibition was still life. And so I'm showing you the first wall in the exhibition, which shows these still lives. Um, and is because in the 19th century and in, in this uh, dated back and, and actually to London and the Royal Academy and uh, even into the 18th century, there was a hierarchy of art that was considered important. And um, history painting and portraits were sort of at the top of the echelon. And down towards the bottom, the very lowest level of what was considered important art was still life. Uh, it didn't it have important scenes from history. It didn't have portraits of, of famous people. Um, and because it was sort of the bottom of, of the, the ranking, it was something that was acceptable for women. Like if, if women were still life painters, they weren't really going to be competing on the same level with men and, and sort of disrupting things too much. And also in the 19th century, uh, women would go sometimes, uh, depending on their social status, to young ladies finishing schools. And one of the kinds of things you might be taught at these finishing schools, I'm thinking Jane Austen novels here, would be to make watercolor paintings of still lifes or nature or learn how to play the piano. It's something that would make you an entertaining uh, social companion. So we start out with this wall here. And what I wanted to point out is that we have on this wall, uh, the 19th century painter, Helen Searle, next to the 21st century artist, Ebony Bolt, and next to the 20th century artist, um, George O'Keefe. And I, I really liked to make this setup. And one of the things I point out usually in tours of these tours or when people are in person, is that a lot of thought, uh, next time you're in a museum exhibit, think about uh, the curators pondering how they're gonna hang things and what they want to say to you with the way they're hanging things. And so Victoria and I set up this intentionally to show you all the different centuries that were going to be in the exhibit and the fact that we felt like they, they communicated with each other across time and genre and media with each other by the way we were setting up the exhibition. Next slide, please. So 
So, so here's a closer look at the Helen Searle. And Helen Searle is perhaps not um, a name that rolls off the tongue today, but there's a lot that's been said about that in terms of the historical record. A lot of times, you know, you'll see memes on the internet and somebody will say like, how many women artists can you name? Can you name five women artists? Can you name three women artists? Who can you name besides Georgia O'Keeffe? And, um, you know, feel free to put comments in the chat about that. But I confess that, you know, even going through a master's degree in art history, Helen Searle was not necessarily someone that I had learned about. And in fact, in trying to find quotes by the artists, we put a quote by every artist on the labels. We could not find a quote, uh, even with the advantage of the internet and digitized records, we could not find a quote of something that Helen Searle herself had said. Uh, even though at the time she became a really successful artist. She was a, the daughter of an architect. Uh, she was from Vermont. She uh, grew up in Rochester and she um, was exhibiting from very early on in life. Uh, the Buffalo Fine Arts Academy she displayed at, she displayed in 1866 at the National Academy of Design. She went off and studied in Dusseldorf. She had a very full career and married another artist. And one of the only quotes we could, uh, references to her in uh, publications at the time we could find was talking about her husband and how his wife was also an artist. So I didn't really want to use a quote like that in, uh, in this show when it's featuring women, although it was a positive quote. It said she was a well-known artist. Um, so we picked, the quote I picked for this piece had to do with, um, I found two books that were written about women artists, one in the 19th century, one in the early 20th century. And I found that very interesting because lest we think that in the 21st century, we are being big heroes to go back and rescue the reputation of women artists. That is not at all true. In 1859, Elizabeth Fries Ellett was already writing a book called Artists in All Ages and Countries, Women Artists in All Ages and Countries. And there was another book written in 1904, all about women artists. And certainly during the height of the, the women's uh, movement in the 1970s, there was much scholarship done on women artists. So anyway, you can see the quote on the screen, Elizabeth Ellett said, should the perusal of my book inspire with courage and resolution any woman who aspires to overcome the difficulties in achievement of honorable independence, or should it lead to a higher general respect for the powers of women and their destined position in the realm of art, my object will be accomplished. So, you know, what Sarah Linda was saying, and I will echo, it seems very, very powerful that we're having this tour today when a woman has just been elected vice president of our United States. I think Elizabeth Ellett would be very pleased. Um, can we, and I just noticed also there's a bird here, you know, here she's set up this still life with birds and fruit. And I love it when an artist takes the notion of a, of a still life and dead things as the Tate definition said, but sets it outside so that you see a view of the actual landscape and living plants and, and, and living birds all participating in this, this bounty of, of the still life, uh, this cornucopia of, of fruits here. Um, and, and just remember those birds, because when we get to Ebony Bolt, I didn't even notice until we set up the exhibition, her piece is full of birds also. Next slide, please. So um, most people, if they, and this is a testament to the power of Georgia O'Keeffe art, if people can only name one woman artist uh, of any nationality and any time period, they will usually mention Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, Georgia O'Keeffe known for her flower paintings, who was not necessarily pleased that everyone would interpret her flower paintings and, and make all kinds of assumptions about them, uh, which, you know, uh, may or may not be true. Uh, some of the things people say that they're meant to represent, but she said, uh, you know, 
the paraphrase of this quote here is watch out thinking you know what I mean when I'm just, you know, depicting these flowers in my art. And this drawing, which is in the museum's collection is a banana flower. So not the usual type of flower painting you're used to seeing from Georgia O'Keeffe. Georgia O'Keeffe, who um, came, came to uh, the fore really um, in the 19 teens and 20s, she uh, was showing at Alfred Stieglitz's gallery. She ended up marrying him and being in a relationship with him for many years. But in a, in a very difficult period when she was suffering from depression, she went to Bermuda to uh, re, you know, renew herself and recover and uh, in the quiet and the beauty of the landscape in Bermuda at a friend's uh, estate. And she started to go out and walk around in nature and she started drawing these banana flowers in these intimate studies of sort of one living element of nature. So instead of a still life and dead things, she's focusing in and not showing you the rest of the landscape around it, but just focusing in on, on this one thing in great detail. She did a whole series of these banana flowers of which the museum has one in the Connect collection. Next slide, please. So then we'll look again at Ebony Bolt, who we saw before. Ebony Bolt was in the museum's exhibition a few years ago called The Neo-Victorians. We became aware of her art. And this is a light box. So it looks very different when you see it in person because it's, it's actually glowing. And her forms are informed by uh, one somewhat of a figural work. She's always has a sketchbook on her. And when she's traveling around New York City, she's sketching people on the subway or on the street. But then she's combining them into these beautiful patterns that are influenced by Victorian art and William Morris and these sorts of um, patterns of flowers and birds here. And this is called Botanical Dreams in the concrete jungle. And it is, um, again, something we've been thinking about a lot lately in our exhibitions, showing how nature can refresh us. Nature can uplift us when, when we're feeling down, when we're feeling like closed in upon by the, the buildings and the crowds of the big city, by the fact that we're not supposed to go out and do things. Uh, art of nature and actual nature can refresh us. Next slide, please. Victoria, do you want to talk about some of the deeper themes that we sometimes find in, in still life? Sure. So as you, if you're in person in the galleries, as you turn the corner from those first three pieces, we start moving into, instead of um, the lushness of life and of natural beauty, we start moving into cycles of life and death and kind of a theme of memento mori. And you can see it in this, in this first wall where you get the autumn leaves and the dying plant, and then this um, still life by Lily Martin Spencer, um, which we'll show again, we'll show in the next slide. So Olivia, can you switch slides? Thank you. So this is um, by Lily Martin Spencer, and the piece is re to represent the Civil War. So within it, you get very traditional kind of iconography where you get the fruit and you get the flowers and it's very dark, but it's if you look closely, the peach in the center is starting to bruise and rot. So it's very symbolic and it's using this kind of symbolism to tell a story despite it being just a still life, they can still have these, if you look deeply into them, you can really understand a lot of a story within it. And when we were looking for quotes, we found a letter that she had written to her mother and in it, her mother had um, urged her to attend a women's rights meeting in Massachusetts and she had replied, that she wasn't really interested in it and that she was more focusing on her artwork. And we're, we're thinking that since she was unwilling to engage in feminist politics, she would probably was taking another route to independence with her own artwork and using that as a way to kind of pave her own way. Next slide, please. <clears throat> then above that piece in um, the galleries, we have this um, watercolor from Ellen Robbins 
And Ellen Robbins was a botanical illustrator known for her paintings of wildflowers and autumn leaves. And after her father's death, when she was still a child, um, she started trying to help the family's finances. And after, even though, after Drew trying different kinds of domestic jobs, she landed on painting watercolors. And even though she had some training, she was mostly self-taught, which is incredibly, um, incredibly, can't think of the word right now, but it, like, it's very um, impressive. There we go. It's very impressive seeing how amazing her pieces are. Because in her 20s, she began producing books of her illustrations, and they were selling for $25 each, which was a lot at the time. And her success with her flowers led her to start doing also autumn leaves. And they were known as being so realistic that a contemporary wrote that these might land on her flowers, and that sometimes the leaves were mistaken for real leaves by viewers. So they're really stunning to see. And it's just amazing to think that she was able to do this all with just very limited teaching. Next slide, please. <clears throat> then we have a uh, French photographer, Josephine Douay, um, who was initially in another exhibition of ours. And within it, she was inspired by the painter, Andrew Wyeth. So she followed his path around Pennsylvania and which was very much where he was painting lots of scenes. And she kind of took inspiration by that. And she wanted to find what the camera could reveal about both the world and what Wyeth kind of devoted his artwork to. And while walk going around, she would, in the rural settings, she would say that um, she called the land a land of never ever ending poetry. So she'd walk the land and find these moments and kind of capture them. And it's one of those things that kind of leads us into this memento mori where even within nature, you get this kind of death, you get this, but it, even then it's still beautiful. So you get this very beautiful arc, you get the very, very saturated kind of sepia tones. And it's just very, um, it really makes you think more than just a photograph of a flower. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Continuing on with our memento mori, we have this photograph by Audrey Flack. So Audrey Flack is a very well-known painter and sculptor, and she's very well-known for her very large, hyper-realistic paintings. And the way that she makes them is she will set up these little still lives and take photographs of them and then blow them up really large in her paintings. So <clears throat> within it, she's always been able to kind of be inspired by the old Venetas painting. So she always kind of has this kind of memento mori kind of the more you look at it, the more you um, understand the piece and her own inspiration within it. So this piece is called World, World War II. And Audrey Flack, as a Jewish woman herself, was kind of reminiscing on the war itself. And in the background, there's a photograph by a woman artist uh, from the Holocaust of survivors. And Audrey con uh, contradicts that kind of suffering, but with like cakes and this rose and the fruit, but the fruit itself is also kind of starting to brown and rotten. Next slide. So this piece is not in the show, um, but we wanted to show it as an example of her still of her um, hyper realistic paintings and their size. So this is Audrey Flack next to one of her paintings. You can see just how huge they are. And also within it, you get that very um, symbolic kind of use of different kind of imagery that she's carried on um, the broke time. <clears throat> so in this one, you get a large rose that's in bloom um, over a portrait of her and her mother, but the, you know that, that that flower will soon die. And also there's trappings of uh, femininity. So there's lots of makeup in it and mirrors, but then vain attempts at kind of trying to ward off the inevitable um, effects of time. So you and then you get the watch in it as well. So you also so you you her pieces really make you think and make you look into them for long amounts of time. Next slide. One of my favorite pieces in the show um, really also does that where you the longer you look, the more you see. <clears throat> and I love that within certain artworks. And this section of the exhibition is really strong in that. So this is The Underworld by Anne McCoy. And it's a lithograph, it's two pieces that are framed together, they continue each other. So that's why you can kind of see that line down the center. And 
the series was really a breakthrough to her because it was the first figurative work after, of hers after years of doing just underwater landscape. And Anne McCoy, as a practitioner of alchemy and as someone who studies it, is very inspired by that. And that's what the, part of the series comes from. And it was all kind of inspired by a dream. So in her dream, the underworld and underwater started to merge. So that's why in this piece, you can kind of see these kind of skeletal figures, you see bones, you see kind of monsters and demons, but you can also see sharks and octopus and turtles. And so you kind of get this very strange, surreal moment in it. And I think one of my favorite parts of her quote from her was saying that she began this series on it terrified the collector who financed them, which I just think is kind of hilarious, but I love that piece so much for that reason. You kind of it has a shock value. And then the longer you look at it, the more kind of life it, you kind of get out of it. Next slide. <clears throat> so continuing into still kind of still life and nature, but at the same time, a little bit of surrealism, we have Song Minan's Aphrodisiac 30, which is part of her Aphrodisiac series. Um, so in it, Song Min, uh, um, is very inspired by very traditional Asian iconography and style. So you get um, a very something very similar to Asian landscapes, but she's kind of turned them on their head. And in them, she's kind of including them in bowls of noodles and the noodles are pulling and they become a waterfall. And then also it's kind of overflowing from the bowl. And in it, she's saying that she's very um, attached to the Taoist kind of mother nature um, idea where nature fulfills you physically and spiritually, but then also you get the male, the masculine and the feminine and sex and food and everything that kind of nourishes you in both body and soul is very inspired by, um, she's very inspired by within these pieces. And these, this is one of those pieces that a photo really doesn't do it justice. When you see it in person, the back is all gold metallic paint. So it kind of shines. And it's very, very stunning. Next slide. So in the exhibition, this piece is not next to Song Min's, but we wanted to include it in this section because it, because she kind of, uh, Judy Guerra includes physical pieces of clothing in her artwork. And we like the idea that she was kind of adding a physical object into the painting and making you look at it in a different way. So Judy Guerra is a transgender artist based in New York City, and her work deals with identity, her own identity as a transgender woman, the politics of femininity, passing and rituals of womanhood. So in this piece, it was very inspired by her own life. And initially, the clothing wasn't going to be such a prominent feature in it. But then as she was kind of working, it, she was inspired by her own thoughts of what it is to be feminine, what, how feminine does she want to be? um what processes are she is she going to go through to make herself seem more feminine to others and kind of battling that kind of back and forth in her own mind and within that process a mentor of her started policing her choice in clothing for the piece so the mentor was saying that they weren't feminine enough they weren't ladylike or anything and they were too so to kind of counteract that in response to that, Judy threw them right in the center of it. And it was just everything that the piece was initially even inspired by kind of became even stronger by this reaction to someone who was a mentor. So you get um, these large uh, pieces of clothing and then it's also the clothing that she wore to um, the studio each day that she was working, which I love. It's, it's a really personal piece. It's not something that she just bought for the artwork. It's really her clothing, what she was wearing at the time. And it's cut across and the bright colors. And it and if you see it in person, if you zoom in on it at some point, there's scissors across it. So it's really like cutting. And um, so it's kind of sewing and cutting and piecing together what she's trying to figure out for herself. And it's a very moving piece because of that. Um, next slide. So yeah, that was a really, um, I think you'll agree after hearing me and Victoria talk about still life that even though in the 19th century, 
it was relegated to the least uh, impressive of the arts. There are many different meanings that can be associated and conveyed through a still life painting. This is the wall where we're sort of turning, um, uh, shifting subjects a little bit, but I saw it as uh, connected that we're, we were talking about still life and sort of small inanimate objects before, but now we're sort of broadening out to other objects that are in the real world with us, like architecture inside and out. And the first piece on the wall, which uh, will, why don't we move to the next slide and um, we'll see a better view of it, is a photograph by Berenice Abbott. So in a way, we're still a little bit in the still life realm here in that it's a photograph of an object. Uh, Berenice Abbott, is better known for straight, uh, like uh, sort of photo, almost photojournalist street photography during the depression. But later in her career, she actually did these stop motion photographs as part of a science to, to be illustrations in scientific studies. This was around 1960. And so we have this, this pendulum stopped in motion uh, in this photograph by her. And just, you may have noticed, we didn't really make a big deal about it, but on the labels in the exhibition and also on these slides, we have images of the artists. It's a, it seemed like the show was so imbued with a sense of identity for all the artists that we wanted to show images of the artists. And this one here by Barbara Morgan of Bernice Abbott with her cat, sort of, we showed it last time too. It sort of does double purpose. It is an image by Barbara Morgan, her friend who was a fellow photographer, but it's also a portrait of Bernice Abbott. In a moment, I'll show you another portrait of um, Bernice Abbott, but so, um, and she's with her cat. And uh, I loved it because I just found, I happened to be looking at a book that's a biography of Bernice Abbott and it was talking about her longtime relationship with the poet Elizabeth McCausland, her lover. And somebody had said about their household that um, they, they like to play board games like Percheesi and one friend called them homebodies with house cats. So we love cats in the curatorial department and we love the fact that Bernie Sabat was photographed with her cat. Here, I just wanted to show you a detail of that photograph because it's so tall and thin, it's kind of hard to see what's going on with it. And this is a photograph of Bernice Abbott in Paris in the 1920s with her camera. And she, she had, had had a very successful career uh, starting out in Paris. She was uh, mentored by the photographer Man Ray. And then when she came back to New York, what she's really well known for is during the depression, she was, um, uh, what is, uh, Sarah Linda's writing something in that. I, I, I don't see what it is, Sarah Linda. You know who took this photograph? Oh, no, 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 it's not saying? important. I was just commenting on her hairdo that it was like very 1920s. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of hard when I'm looking at this, the two split screen here and then I see a chat come by and I don't know if I'm supposed to stop. But yes, I love this photograph of Brownie Sabbath. And she came back to New York and because she was so interested in photojournalism at, and straight photography at a time when there was still sort of a vestige of the more pictorial types of photography that were popular in the early 20th century, it took her a while to find her way. But during the depression, she did work for the WPA and did a huge um, series of photographs of New York City. And, and we had highlighted another quote by her in the other uh, tour where somebody had said once she was in a neighborhood where, where ladies shouldn't be uh, you know, hanging out, it wasn't safe. And she said something like, I'm, I'm not a, a nice lady, I'm a photographer. Um, and so we, we really loved that quote. Um, next slide, please. So moving along, uh, we have Merle Perlmutter's work who's on this call. And um, at the end, when we're done with everything during the question and answer period, maybe Merle will tell us a little bit 
more about this, but um, we have a couple of her wonderful large intaglio prints in the collection that were made during the 1970s. And she had a grant from the Creative Artist Public Service of NISCA that enabled the museum to acquire these prints. And in the quote, she's, she's explaining a little bit how these sort of surreal architectural um, images take place and sh that she's imagining that maybe you can see around a corner or, you know, um, see more of the space at once. We, we've had a lot of artists on view lately that have these kind of ways of wanting to see the world in ways that, that envelop more of it than just the traditional one point perspective view, Marsha Clark being one of them that's in our landscape art and virtual travel show. And it's really hard to see in this slide, but over on the left in the shadows, there is actually a figure standing uh, against the wall. And, um, you know, if let's try to remember at the end uh, and maybe Merle will come on and tell us more about that figure. Uh, Next slide, please. So uh, in this section general, both in the interior view by Merle Perlmutter and in these next two slides, which are architectural exterior views, we have artists that are thinking about the different ways we see things, how to convey them to a viewer or a visitor in the museum. And this is one that it really helps to see in person because it projects off the wall. And in the center, you have, excuse me, two mirrors that are, are sort of made into a corner and fitted into the piece so that it's reflecting off each other. And it, it does give you this sense of being completely surrounded by this architectural ruin, which is Bannerman's Castle up on the Hudson and being able to see a, a bunch of it at once. And um, so and she, a lot of Sus Susan Leopold's work is about uh, abandoned structures and trying to show that even in their decay, they're, they're magnificent. Uh, about 15 years ago, we had an entire show of these pieces of her work and then she gave us this one. Next slide, please. Now, uh, another uh, Susan, Susan Whitus, who has also shown at the museum, she has uh, is a photographer who has used a lot uh, a tilt lens and takes these uh, landscape photographs where she's really forcing you to to think about what you're seeing in a different way. And, and then after her exhibit, she did give the museum a few of her photographs that we selected. And this one I particularly love. I actually drive by this building almost every day because I live in White Plains. And so because it's a mirrored building, you really get this strange effect where you're not really sure what you're seeing where it, it almost disappears and becomes part of the the lower busy landscape around it and and the sky and um you know you really have to think about what you're seeing next slide please so we do have abstract you know work in the exhibition um not, not a lot, and, and that's not because women have not been abstract artists, but we were also, when Victoria and I were working on this, we've been working on an inventory of the collection, and we were really starting from a point of what's in the collection, what are our strengths in the collection, who are the artists we know um, in our community. And I like to show these two together. This is Louise Nevelson and Yvonne Tom because another thing that we're thinking about a lot when we were thinking about feminist art history, the historical record, um, intersectionality, like all, all these kinds of things is, is sort of the vagaries of history and who writes it and who gets remembered and for what. And, and when you look at two strong works like this, one by an artist, Louise Nevelson, who if someone asks you name five women artists, some of you 
might very well name Louise Nevelson, uh, probably the most famous uh, woman artist of the American, you know, sort of um, abstract and minimalist period. And then Yvonne Thomas, wonderful color field abstraction here in our collection, whose name does not necessarily roll off the tongue, who had a very full career. We can see the next slide, uh, there'll be a detail of that. So this piece called Central Rhythm is by Yvonne Thomas, who was born in France, lived her life in the United States. Uh, it's not a huge painting. It's about uh, 28 by 26 inches. And, uh, but she uh, exhibited with the abstract expressionists. She uh, was making art all during the color field era. You know, you could compare her to people like Robert Motherwell, Mark Rothko. Um, and she was in all these exhibitions and somehow, you know, and she's in the collections of MoMA, uh, RISD, the Brooklyn Museum. Um, and I, when I was researching her, um, which was made easier now that so many uh, collections and uh, you know historical records are on the internet, it makes it easier, especially when you're locked down during COVID. Um, I couldn't, I learned more about her and that she had a very full career and exhibited up until her death in 2009. And yet uh, her, her papers are at the Smithsonian uh, Archives of American Art and they are not digitized. And I'm not really blaming them on that. Sometimes, you know, when places have a small staff and they sort of will proceed in the order of, well, who's asking about these people? So I'm, I'm not trying to um, cast aspersions or make conclusions, but I am asking you to think about who who writes history and and you know and who gets remembered for what um and uh that has really been the case uh sometimes with women artists and uh, particularly women artists of color that sometimes um you feel almost like people are being written out of the historical record um next slide please So this gives you a little bit of a better look at the Louise Nevelson. This is a small um, a box, uh, one of her works. Uh, it's very typical. Sometimes she did these very large constructions uh, that are similar to this. This is a one particular uh, small piece. Uh, Louise Nevelson, as I said, one of the best known artists of the uh, 1960s, 70s, and you know, up until her death in the 1980s. Um, and she often did work with uh, found pieces of wood as her, in her sculptures. And sometimes artists will pick these found materials simply because they are expedient and available to them. Um, she emigrated from, Ukraine, from what is now the Ukraine, when she was young with her family. Uh, she spoke Yiddish at home until she learned English at school. And she had studied at the Art Students League uh, and she had also studied with Hans Hoffman and Heim Gross. And she was really uh, instrumental in the conceptual art movement and you know, got a lot of attention during her lifetime. And we're really happy to have this in the collection. Um, next slide, please. Another artist I was really um, eager to show, this is a very small piece. Um, sorry, the dimension's not there, but it's maybe only about 18 by 12 inches. This is Hannah Lore Barron. It's called Flag. It's an abstraction, but I'm sure with that um, title that you're supposed to have various associations with this. Um, and she uh, is an artist, again, who had a very um, traumatic immigration experience trying to escape um, Nazi Europe with her family and grew up after that in the Bronx. Uh, she lived not far from the, from the museum and actually was in a group show here in the 1960s. And I kept hearing about her and somehow 
with, with all this adversity, her work did get seen and during her lifetime and even after she died of, of cancer at a fairly um, young age, she was only um, not quite 50 years old. Um, she, her art did get recognized and um, these beautiful uh, collages made with found fabrics um, have, have really been celebrated by museums and galleries over the years. One thing that's very poignant that we found in this quote is in the museum catalog that she was in is she said that she worked small because in, in the vastness of uh, New York and outer space, she felt very small. And so she worked on these very intimate pieces of collage. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I wanted, uh, uh, when Victoria talked about Judy Guerra, she mentioned that even though uh, just in preparing for this talk, I thought it might be interesting to show Judy's work in comparison with the still lives. But, you know, when we, when we lay out exhibits, we're also often thinking of the aesthetics of it and just, you know, in an objective kind of visual sense, what's gonna be an interesting conversation and I thought that Judy's work looked really interesting next to the, the last piece I'm gonna talk about, which is by Nancy Graves, uh, which is here on the right. Uh, next slide, please. So, so this is actually uh, the breaking news as of preparing for this talk. Um, we're learning more about this print, uh, this silkscreen by Nancy Graves than we knew before, um, which is it's, it's untitled. And Nancy Graves um, was, uh, is maybe not someone that, that would be on that list of people that you think of when you think of women artists, but she is uh, one of the most um, recognizable and important names in women's uh, American women's art, women's art of the 1960s, uh, 70s, 80s, and uh, was one of was the first woman to have a one person show, I believe, at the Whitney Museum. She was in a wave of artists who were reacting against pop art and minimalism, and was in sort of reintroducing a lot of imagery in various ways back into her art. Some of it very different from this uh, in her show at the Whitney. She made sculptures of, of life-size or over life-size camels. They were sort of taxidermy, but more like a patchwork sculpture that resembled taxidermy. So she did all kinds of art and she was very fascinated by natural history because her father worked in a natural history museum and she loved maps. A lot of times her art is influenced by maps. And I didn't really see this piece that way. I've tried to research it a lot of times over the years, it's untitled. It was done as part of a series of prints that Lincoln Center used to commit co commission from artists related to various events that Lincoln Center was going to have. This one is, um, related to a holiday celebration that Lincoln Center was, was going to be putting on at the 10th annual community holiday festival. Sometimes artists would include these words on their print and other times when it was made into a poster later, like this one, that's when the words were added. Um, and so I was trying to interpret this as maybe some kinds of symbols. It didn't really look like a map to me. A lot of her work is sort of abstractions derived from maps. But then just while I was working on this talk, I saw one for sale. And in that sale, it mentioned that it's untitled for aerial landscapes. So when I say this is breaking news, this is something that Victoria and I are gonna research further uh, to see if we can find more corroboration of the fact that this grid of images is meant to be some kind of aerial views, which would make a lot of sense since uh, Nancy Graves was very taken with and often used imagery 
related to maps. Uh, she also, in some of her drawings, it looks like bricks. Yes, Sarah Linda said it looked like urban brickwork. And when it said it was a community festival, I was wondering if that was supposed to be what you were reading into this, almost as if these are posters on a brick wall somewhere. Um, I mean, I think it, in the end of the day, her work is abstract, but there's many different ways for work to be abstract. And some of the most interesting abstract work is still work that you can tease a lot of meanings and references out of, at least for me, um, having been trained initially in 19th century art and even Renaissance art. Uh, I love it when um, you can still find a lot of uh, references and rich meanings in work that is abstract. And I think that pretty much takes us to the end. We've almost been going on till uh, 2.30. So I'd, I'd like to ask Olivia if we have any questions. And before we answer questions, Merle, did you want to come on and say anything else about your piece? We could go back to that slide if you wanted to do that. Do we have Meryl anywhere? You're, you're I'm just popped. unmuting, trying to unmute her. Let's see. Ask to unmute. How's that? Oh, we hear you. Perfect. Okay. You know, I think the easiest thing for me to do would be to ask a question and, and I can answer it if anybody has any questions. Okay. I have a question, actually. If yeah. nobody else has a question, I had one, Merle. I, yeah. I just, um, in looking at your work, you know, I, it, I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing like Durer, I'm seeing M.C. Escher. I'm wondering if you consider these artists, precedent artists, an influence, what you were looking at, and what about if, if that's the case? you know, taking their um, investigation of space and time into consideration and taking it a step further and personalizing it? I think that's a great question because um, of course, Dura was one of the original printmakers mm -hmm. and I'm a printmaker and deal in black and white, um, which forces you to look at the world in a different way. And Escher, which is so interesting, I've been compared to Escher because he also warps space, which I do. I don't know if he warped it for the reasons I warped the space. But um, when I started warping space, I had never seen Escher. Don't forget, I'm no spring chicken here. <laughs> so by the time he came, became popular, I was already deep into it. So it seems like there's a right time for artists in different areas to somehow make similar investigations. I don't understand the purpose behind that, but that happens. But I do believe that warping the space, in doing that, you can take your flat surface and create almost like a motion picture where you can actually walk through the space and see areas you would not actually see if you put an easel up and just drew what you saw because you wouldn't be able to see around walls and into rooms that are beyond your vision. So to me, that's been fun to do that. It's interesting and it's sort of like traveling. And so you put time into this instead of an instantaneous, like a photograph, which gives you an instant and um, a painting, which sometimes gives you a little more than an instant. So that's the reason why the work might be similar, but I'm not sure what his, that his purpose was exactly the same as mine. I think Esh's purpose was more to confine, to confound the mind. <laughs> and I like that, you know, I like that part of it. And I, 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 I like to do that too. Yeah. So this almost, it, you know. it, it expands, it expands the mind because you know, it's it's a two dimensional surface, but it's really a four dimensional representation because you've taken time into consideration. That's right, and I'm yeah. I'm glad you get that. And um, time is a consideration, and I I sit there with uh, for this piece and many others. I sit there with a multiple drawings, and as each drawing, I move slightly to a different space, and then 
I get away from the scene that's in front of me and, and make that into one drawing, which I, I then change into an, an etching. And so, the etching process actually gives you something that, that um, the drawing process can't give you for some reason, which is, which is interesting. Wow, it's just, so, thank you. It's, it. it's just such a, a laborious um, and a process must take so long, particularly because you've chosen to create an etching um, that really, you know. Is the figure you? Is the figure in the shadows you? Yeah, that's from lack of having a model. Yeah, <laughs> that's the younger me. I don't look like that anymore, but that was the younger me. I would stand in the mirror and make sketches of myself. And that's why the figures are all often front on because they would be from a mirror and they'd be me. <laughs> uh, one of them is my daughter, but you don't, you don't have that print though. <laughs> Thanks, Merle. Um, Thanks. Olivia, do we have any other questions? So we don't have anything from Facebook right now. Um, you know, if you are watching on Facebook, you are welcome to ask any questions. Um, you're feel, feel free to put your questions in the chat if you're here on Zoom with us. Um, but as of right now, we don't have very many. Is there any closing thoughts you want to leave us with, Laura and Victoria? I mean, I hope that if you are in the area and, and you are willing to come out and be socially distanced in a mask, uh, you're welcome to come to the exhibition. It's, it's here until um, the 3rd of January. Uh, and Sarah Linda usually uh, has some things to say about other things people could do sure. online or in person if they, if they wanna come to the museum. I, I always have more to say. Um, so um, thank you all so much for being here. And I did put something in the chat. Um, you might see a couple things I put in the chat. The very first thing is just directing you to more resources and, and they are educational resources for all ages because we're all lifelong learners. Um, but we do have a site uh, called Museum From Home. And um, on that site, we have resources that are connected to this particular exhibition. Uh, and there are um, uh, resources, activities, um, uh, you know, sort of guided art explorations, and they're all inquiry based. So it, it gets you to look at the works and ask and ask questions and really think about them. And there are specific ones on Nevelson, on Ebony Bolt, on Georgia O'Keeffe, and a new series that we're doing, um, which are called Collection Conversations that compare and contrast the Hannah Lore Baron and the Yvonne Thomas, which um, if you think about a dialogue between those two artists or those two artworks, how interesting, what an interesting way that is to, um, to see them in, an, in a new perspective, in a new light, very much um, like what Laura and, and Victoria were talking about in terms of curatorial decisions about you know, what to put next to each other, what to put near each other. Um, because every time you rehang something, um, it encourages you to look at it differently, um, depending on what it's in, uh, whose company it's in. So I really encourage people to check out Museum From Home and also uh, to come back and visit us for uh, some of our future uh, special events, special programs this month coming up. We have next weekend, we have two incredible artists. On Saturday, we have a workshop in drawing the head with um, Julia Santos Solomon whose work is featured in Women to the Fore, and she is our teaching artist in residence uh, for the year, um, connected to the exhibition Landscape Art and Visual tra and Virtual Travel. Um, and on Sunday, we have Cynthia Daniel, whose work Light Atlas was the inspiration for that exhibition. And she's gonna be doing a virtual artist talk um, called Postcards from America. So we have two, contemporary female artists um, next weekend. So I invite you to, um, to come back then. Uh, and also, as Laura mentioned, on the 18th, we have a virtual road trip with uh, Librado Romero. He will be in his exhibition 
and in the landscape art exhibition, looking at various uh, works of art from the artist's point of view, artist's insight, and thinking about how artists not only look at the landscape, but how they choose to render it. And uh, finally, toward the end of the month on the 22nd, we have a virtual talk on the healing power of herbs, rue, rosemary, and basil coming to us from Mexico uh, from a Mexican environmentalist named Agar Garcia, um, who will be talking about the, um, the power of herbs in traditional medicine. So uh, also something about the healing power of nature, um, which Laura mentioned before. So there's lots coming up. And um, we are so happy to have you and look forward to seeing you all um, at future at future programs. And um, I wanna thank Laura, Victoria, Olivia um, for a wonderful way to spend a, a Sunday afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, I wanna thank all y'all too. Always a pleasure to give programs with Victoria and Sarah and Olivia. Thank you. And thank you, Merle. So nice to meet you virtually. Yes. <laughs> this Have was a wonderful fun. day. Yeah. Thank, thank you all. You. Take care.